So hi again everybody. I'm testing out a, uh, a new background, my bookshelf. This is another corner of my office and I think I'm finally getting better with the lighting. I apologize for my ridiculous hair. This is not morning hair. This is I've been wearing a hat all day, ridiculous greasy hair, but I'm extremely excited to get started with a series discussing some fundamental concepts of, concepts of economics. Uh, I just can't wait to get started talking about that stuff. I don't have time to make myself look pretty. I want to start getting these, I these ideas out there. Um, so I've got this idea that there's a way to make economics accessible to everybody by just doing a series of fairly short videos focused on the essential building blocks, the essential conceptual building blocks of economic theory in general. Uh, this video is probably going to be just a little longer because I want to introduce the concept of what I want to do in the series as well as do kind of the first lesson, which is going to be about uh, defining the term real savings. But I, my hope is that I'll be able to produce a series of videos that are 10 minutes or less, maybe 15 minutes, I don't know, something like that, where each video I'll just define one concept. And if I do it right, it'll sound like I'm just stating the obvious every time. I'm just stating things that everyone already knows, but then when we put them together, hopefully we'll suddenly understand the mysteries of the banking system and the economy and all of that stuff. I really believe that understanding economics is something that is accessible to everyone, that it's not complicated, that the fundamentals are very simple, and the intuition you already have about the real world can apply directly to understanding banking and interest rates and credit and the stock market. There's nothing fundamentally different and crazy about that stuff that makes it hard, that should make it hard for you to understand. But the fact is that the way it's described most of the time makes it unnecessarily complex. And actually, there's a couple of quotes that I love. Uh, one is from Henry Ford. And uh, I'm just going to read it to make sure I get it right. Uh, Ford said, It's well enough that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution by tomorrow morning. And there's another quote from John Kenneth Galbraith, who's uh, kind of a, a famous and uh, reasonably respected Harvard uh, economist and professor. And he said, The study of money above all fields in economics is one in which complexity is used to disguise truth or evade truth, not to reveal it. Emphasis mine. Not to reveal it. The process by which banks create money is so simple, the mind is repelled. With something so important, a deeper mystery seems only decent. But, but there is no deeper mystery. When you start to try to understand the way the banking system works and how credit is created, you, it, it makes your mind sort of go sideways. You're like, what? What? And you think that because you don't understand it, that there, it must be something that's wrong with you. It must be that you're not smart enough to understand all the, the, the complex stuff that only the PhDs, you know, are, are uh, equipped or capable or allowed to, to access. This is not true in my, my humble opinion, right? This is just my humble opinion. And I will confess again, I'm on my se second beverage of the evening. Uh, I ran out of cranberry juice, so this is just vodka with a lime. This is how my father-in-law taught me how to drink vodka. It goes down easy. Uh, but anyway, that's just that's my little introduction, and today I want to talk about the concept of real savings. And I want to illustrate what real savings means two different ways. One, with an example of the Caruso economy. Uh, Robinson Crusoe stranded on a desert island all by himself, and what, as a thought experiment, and then the other as the, with the example of how a student loan works. And like I said, if I do this right, as I explain it, you'll just be nodding and you'll say, what, what's the point? You're just saying like two and two is four and the sky is blue. What's the point? But then when we extend it to these are the things that you can use to understand how banking works and how the economy works, hopefully they'll be an aha moment. I know that's how it was for me as I came to understand this stuff. And maybe in a separate video, I'll explain my journey of coming to like, you know, to see what I think is the truth about economics. But for now, I'm going to try to get into the, to the focus point here. 
Okay, so first, why do I say real savings instead of just savings? What's the point of the term real? It's like, do, am I afraid that you're going to think I'm talking about fake savings? <laughs> Which seems silly, right? And But it's not fake savings that's, uh, you know, that's not a term that <laughs> has a lot of meaning, but there is a term that does in economics have a lot of meaning which is called nominal, nominal savings or nominal prices. And the technical definition there in economics is that when you talk about real prices, you're adjusting for inflation. But when you talk about nominal prices, you're not making any adjustment, you're just saying whatever the price is. That's sort of like saying that the real number of inches in a foot is 12 but nominally we're going to call it 13 inches this year. Like nominal prices, nominal savings are applying labels to things that bastardize the traditional unit of measurement. That, that's what nominal means, unfortunately. Um, and, and so, of course, if you're trying to really understand how many inches are in a foot, if you're trying to really understand how many ounces are in a pound or how many cents are in a dollar, you don't care about the nominal business of how we redefine a, un a unit of measurement. You care about what the real weight you're going to get is. So that's the reason why I use the term real savings instead of just saying savings. Real means that we're talking about the actual physical value, the real value. It's not an abstract uh, thing on paper. It doesn't mean that there can't be forms of savings that are represented through paper that's sort of like the 200 level class will get there. But to illustrate what I mean by real savings, I would invite you all to consider the idea of what some of my favorite economists call the Robinson Crusoe economy. So imagine that you are Robinson Crusoe or you are yourself and you're stranded on a desert island. You're the only person uh, on the island and you just sort of, you wake up on the beach, right? You don't have anything. You have no technology or, or anything. So what do you do? Well, you've got to stay alive somehow, right? You've got to find some shelter and you've got to find some food and some water, right? So you build yourself a, a little lean-to, you figure out where you can collect some water, and you're trying to figure out how can I collect enough food to keep myself alive on this island all by myself. Maybe you find a whole bunch of edible berries and fruit, and you're able to harvest and collect enough food every day in order to sustain yourself. Now let's say maybe there's a stream on this island with some some fish that you see swimming by that look delicious and maybe you try to create a little spear to, to try to catch some fish that way but you realize that's extremely hard and maybe the the best way you can think of to catch some fish is to build a net right like maybe there's some kind of indigenous plant or some tree bark or whatever that you can pull apart and string into a net and you think if you could create a net you'd be able to set it up in the stream and start catching fish and a lot of fish enough that you could actually you know feed yourself um, you know maybe for several days with the catch that that you get just in one day instead of spending all your time harvesting berries right I mean, this is completely arbitrary. It's a thought experiment. I know the real economy isn't like this, but these kinds of thoughts, thought experiments are extremely useful just to train your mind how to think about the, the fundamental aspects of reality, which is really what economics is about. Economics is about the reality of human action and social interaction. Now here we're starting with one person, eventually we'll get to two, but we're just starting with one to, to understand human interaction with the world. So you're collecting berries every day, you spend all day collecting berries, you just have enough to eat so that you don't perish. You want to build a net to catch fish, but you realize that to build this net it's going to take like, I don't know, a couple hundred man hours right you're gonna to have to spend half your day every day for a couple of weeks building the net in order to get it to the point where it's gonna help you catch fish and the problem is we, you don't have the you don't have the food the resources to sustain yourself through that process so let's say in our example that actually each day you're able to collect you know 10 or 20 percent more berries then you actually need to eat that day in order to stay alive and to stay 
you know, reasonably in charge of your faculties, right? So that surplus of berries that you collect but you don't eat, that's real savings. That's what savings is, right? I'm stating the obvious. Statings, it, savings is what's left over after you, at, you earn some income and you consume some of it, right? Consuming and spending. Here it's just literally consumption. And then whatever's left that you don't consume, that's your savings, right? I don't have to explain that. It's extremely obvious. The, the fact of savings doesn't change when we get into a modern economy with complex banking and what I would call fiat money or Federal Reserve notes or U.S. dollars as money and banks and all that. The reality of what savings is does not change. Savings is the surplus of production of your income that you don't consume. And why is it important? If there's no savings, there can be no investment. In this example, your investment is the labor that you're going to put in to building the net. Even though that's your labor, you can't invest it in building a net until you saved up enough berries to be able to keep yourself alive while you're doing it. In general, there's this idea in economics that the longer... Uh, okay, I'm not going to talk about that. That's a tangent. Uh, that's a tangent. Without the berries of savings, you can't invest in the net. Without investing in the net, you can never increase your productivity. Therefore, in order to get to a higher level of productivity, you have to be in a place first where you're not consuming all of your production. You have to save some. It's extremely simple, right? So, if a modern-day fractional reserve banker showed up on the island and said, you don't have to save berries. Go ahead and eat all your berries every day. I'll lend you $100,000 to finance the construction of your net. What, what's that going to get you? It's going to get you nothing. That the, the pieces of paper, the notes from the Federal Reserve, don't actually have any real savings associated with them. And what you need in that what you need to finance the construction of your net is food, <laughs> right? Money's only useful if it can get you food. And in this Robinson Crusoe economy, the only way to get food is for you to do work. So the only way for you to free up your labor to work on things that won't immediately lead to food, but will lead to food in the future and will eventually yield much greater food per effort, but with a delay. The only way to allow to put yourself in a position to capitalize on that and to sustain yourself through the delay is to accumulate some savings. Simple enough, right? Okay, so here's another example. Consider the idea of a student loan. A lot of people have experience with that. You want to go to college. You know that if you go to college, you're going to learn things and you're going to get a piece of paper that will increase the value of your labor on the market. You increase your earning potential by having a college education. However, you might not have the money to pay your tuition at, before you start college. You don't have that labor value yet. You might not have the money to pay your room and board and buy your textbooks. So you take out a student loan. Excuse me. So, so what's going on in a student loan transaction? How does that work? What happens is you find a lender, probably a bank, and the bank agrees that if you go to college, you're going to increase the value of your labor. And so they feel comfortable that your future earning potential is good collateral for the loan that they'll give you. They feel confident that there's a good chance you'll be able to pay them back because the reason that you're asking for the loan is you want to go to college, which is a great investment in your future. Good for you. So what happens is you write a note to the bank that says, I owe you whatever you're lending me. I'll pay it back in the future on this time scale. I'll pay it off over five or 10 years or whatever it is with this interest rate and these payment terms. That's a note. That's a, a, a credit instrument that you give to the bank. It's a promise to pay. And in return, the bank gives you money, right? But the, the, the reason why you need money is because it's immediate value. It's value that exists already. Your labor, your college-educated labor, 
is what economists would call future value. It doesn't exist today. It's likely to exist in the future with some probability, but it's not certain. Future value is, is real in the sense that someone like a bank is willing to lend you money against it. But it's not real in the sense that you can't eat it today, right? It's the same for Robinson Crusoe. If he builds the net, it has a certain future value that's related to the number of fish per day he can catch with that net. But the fish don't actually exist yet. He can't, use, he can't eat the fish while he's building the net. The fish only come into play after the net is built. So the reason why he needs savings or he needs a loan of real value and the reason why a student needs a loan of real value is because they only otherwise have access to this uncertain future value and they need some way to sustain themselves. The perverse thing about the way the modern banking system works is that when you take out a student loan, the bank doesn't actually have to have any real savings. They, they, are, they are allowed by the law of the land through under the, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. It's been institutionalized that banks are allowed to lend money into existence. Now, explaining what that means, I'm going to do in another video. All I wanted to do in this video is illustrate the idea that there is such a thing as real savings. Real savings is present value that exists today, that has already been created. It doesn't have to be food. It can be anything that's valuable to anyone, but it has to actually exist, right? I mean, that note, the note that you give to the bank that is your promise to pay for the student loan, that's something that does have value to the bank. They're accepting it as collateral. It's, a, it's worth something. But but the reason it has value is because it's backed by a, a potential future value. So its value today is discounted and you can't, it, it, just, it just doesn't exist yet. What's the little teaser I can give for the future? Where we're going to go with this, oh, should I pick what I'm going to define next? I think I had this figured out before. I'm going to do real savings first. I, maybe money might be next. I might define money next. I'm going to start with real savings, I think, and then we'll do money. That's probably the right order. So I'm going to try to just wrap this up. The, my, my problem is I get so fired up about this stuff. There's so many connections. I, like I said, I really believe that it's not that complicated. Anybody can understand this. But I've spent too much time reading these books that I want to say everything at once. And I know that's not the right way to do it. So I'm trying to stay focused on the idea of real savings, right? It just, just to understand that when we talk about savings in the economy, we're talking about real value that's already been created that hasn't been consumed. And it turns out that knowing the state of real savings in the economy is extremely important to entrepreneurs. It's extremely important to investors. It's extremely important to everyone. It's extremely important to the health of the economy. If a society has a large amount of savings, they have a large pool of resources available for investment and increasing future productivity. And what's more, those investments are, are more likely to pay off because there's all this savings that represents potential future demand. So if you bring new products to market a year from now, there's a good chance someone will be around to buy them because you know that people have saved up all these resources. And if savings are very, very low, well, that means there's, there's far fewer resources available for investment and actually for good reason because investments are less likely to pay off because there's less savings around that could represent potential future demand. And the sad thing about the way our financial system works today is that it's entirely designed to obscure the reality of the current state of real savings. So if that interests you, if that idea interests you in understanding it better and why and how and what does it mean and how should it work, if that interests you, please tune in for the future of this series. I'm pretty sure the next video will be on money trying to define money, but I reserve the right to change my mind. We'll definitely define money eventually, 
I think I'm about 80% sure it'll be the, the next one, but I'm disorganized on. I don't like to plan ahead. Uh, I just like to, um, to, to, to let the universe tell me what to do. And the universe tonight told me that it was time to talk about real savings. So I hope that this resonated at least with some of you. Please ask questions. If this did not make sense, please ask questions. There's nothing I love more than trying to figure out new ways of saying the same thing when we're talking about something important. And in my mind, there's really not much more important. There's like a few things and we could argue, you know, there's, there's interesting debates to have. There's a few things that are probably more important, but the, the fundamentals of how economics works and how we can unleash the power of the free market to improve everyone's standard of living I mean, that's some compelling stuff. I think there's some value there. So thanks for watching. Leave me your feedback. Please ask questions. If you have a question, I'm sure there's plenty of other people that have the same one. And I would love the chance to try to get into the dialogue with you, bring you guys along. Maybe, I'm sure, not maybe, I'm sure I will learn something in the process. Even more than questions, I would love to hear contrary opinions. I think what I've said so far about real savings is fairly non-controversial. But uh, I always love to hear contrary opinions. So please share your feedback and I'll see you next time.